Okay, welcome to video number 36 of the Diaries of a Coronavirologist YouTube channel. Today is the 16th of September and we are up to 29.7 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 around the world and around 937,000 confirmed deaths. So I've talked quite a bit about vaccines on this channel and vaccines get a lot of coverage uh, regarding the COVID pandemic we're dealing with. But today I thought I'd talk about something related but slightly different to vaccination. Now, not everyone is able to take a vaccination. People with severe immune conditions, so people with severe immunocompromising conditions, the elderly sometimes, people with other health conditions, they can't necessarily take a vaccine for safety reasons. And there's people out there who will flat out just not take a vaccine for whatever reason they choose to use. But there are ways that we can leverage the same sort of system into a treatment, which is what monoclonal antibody therapy is. Now, monoclonal antibodies have made the news a little bit this week, which is why I thought I'd talk about them. So two different things that I'm going to be referring to is the Regeneron antibody studies that have led to phase three clinical trials that have been ongoing in America and have just been started in the UK from the University of Oxford in their recovery trial. And today, Eli Lilly announced some results from their clinical work with their own monoclonal antibody. And I thought, because it's in the news, I'd just talk a little bit about monoclonal antibody therapies in this video. So as I say, monoclonal antibody therapy is very intrinsically linked to the way a vaccine works. So in principle, the way a vaccine will work for SARS-2 and for any other virus, the way it does work is it triggers your immune response and generally will produce an antibody response. So when the vaccine goes in or even when a virus goes in and infects, the immune system is triggered and B cells in, in the body produce antibodies. Now these antibodies can be of all different types and varieties and can bi combined to the virus in different ways. So in the context of the SARS-2 virus, antibodies bind to the spike protein, but they can bind to all different parts of that spike protein. The body will select for the B cells that produce antibodies that bind well and can help protect. And then these will ramp up and amplify and your body will produce a huge amount of, of that antibody from those B cells that will protect you or help to clear the viral infection or to react to the vaccine. Once that vaccine or live virus is cleared from the body, those, those grown up B cells will die off, but a few will be left and they will form memory cells. So if you then re-encounter the virus, those memory cells can very quickly ramp up and produce the really effective antibody to protect you from being reinfected. This is the general principle of an antibody mediated vaccine response. So that memory is what's so great about a vaccine because your body retains this knowledge of how to deal with that virus or bacteria or whatever. Uh, but in this context, I'm talking about a virus and therefore protect you from being reinfected. Now, the way that the monoclonal antibody therapy works is to leverage this process and to, in the lab, select for the best antibodies. So it's possible to isolate antibodies from a person and to work out which ones are best able to bind to the virus and inhibit it, its ability to cause an infection. Then in the lab, it's possible to grow up lots and lots of that antibody. So basically getting out the B cells that produce the best antibody, growing up lots and lots and lots of that antibody, and then you can put that directly into a person. So even if that person isn't producing their own antibodies, let's say because they've got some kind of immunodeficiency where they can't produce antibodies, you can put antibodies into them that can be protective. And this is the whole principle behind monoclonal antibody therapy. The idea of the monoclonal comes from the fact that the process, in the process you find the best antibody or antibodies and you make them clonally. So let's say antibody A and antibody B are the two best you find because you got lucky when you were looking at the whole alphabet. You can make a lot of those antibodies clonally so that they're all the same instead of having a through z z i'm starting to forget which one was the english one you end up with just the ones that are the most effective so this brings me to talking about the regeneron work now i just have to say that 
I've been involved with some of this work. I'm on one of the papers that is in the journal Science, which I'll link to down in the description for this video. But I have no financial interest. I'm not promoting this above anything else. Um, I'm just talking about this purely from a scientific standpoint as something that the lab I'm in here has been involved with to a minor extent. So Regeneron took two approaches to find the best antibodies for inhibiting infection by the SARS-2 virus as a potential way to treat COVID-19 with monoclonal antibodies. So as I was describing in the build-up to getting to this point, they took blood from people who had been infected with the SARS-2 virus and developed COVID, and they isolated the B cells and they looked at all the antibodies that were being produced. But they're also a very clever company and they have a mouse that they have produced or a, a, a bunch of mice they have produced called Velcro, Velcro immune mice. And these mice have a human immune system. So they've genetically engineered the mice that they have in their labs to have a human immune system. So then they've infected those mice with SARS-2. Obviously, you can't ethically infect humans. You can only take humans who've already been infected. But they can go and infect mice with the virus, collect the B cells those mice produce, which are these humanized B cells because the mice have a human immune system. And they can use that as another way to find antibodies. So from their two pools, their humanized mice and their human COVID patients, they screen thousands of antibodies and found about 200 which were capable of binding to the SARS-2 spike protein and therefore inhibiting the ability of the virus to infect cells. Now a lot of that work was done with what's known as a pseudotype virus. So this is the shell or the main body of the virus is not the SARS-2 virus, it's something else, but it has the spike, the bit that sticks out of SARS-2. So you can work with this safely because it's not actually the SARS-2 virus, but you're looking at the most important part for antibodies, which is spike. The bits we were involved with regarding this work was actually using the fully infectious SARS-2 virus because we have the BSL-3 facility here. So they generated this pool of 200 different monoclonal antibodies, which could inhibit at a range of different levels and just narrowed down to which ones were capable of causing inhibition easily. So their most potent antibodies, they started to just narrow down. So which one's bound best, which one inhibited most, and so on and so forth. And they ended up with four main candidates. From there, they started to then combine them and look, to where, look at where they bind the spike protein. And what they ended up making was what is now being referred to as Regen, R-E-G-N for Regeneron, Regen CoV-2. So R-E-G-N dash COV2. So this is two of their monoclonal antibodies which work very well individually and then work even better at inhibiting the virus's ability to infect cells when used in combination. And the reason that they seem to work better is that they bind to two different sites on spike. So for example, the antibodies bind to certain areas of spike. Let's say the area of spike is A, B, C, D. One antibody would bind to ABC, sorry, A, B, C, D, E, F. One antibody would bind to ABC. The other one would bind to D, E, F. And then in combination, they have, they're covering more area of spike and therefore are more effective than just one alone. And the other thing, great thing that Regeneron did with this study, uh, again, I'm linking to these papers down below. Both were published in Science, I think, back to back, and we weren't actually involved with the second one. But they looked to see whether it was possible for the virus to mutate and escape their antibodies. So viruses mutate and evolve very rapidly. And it's possible that when you put any kind of pressure through a drug treatment or an antibody treatment on a virus, it may mutate away and therefore be no longer affected. So as I used that example a second ago of A, B, C, D, E, F, it's possible that that could become A, B, M, E, F, G. I may have missed some letters, but some of those letters could change. And therefore, it may mean that an antibody that would just bind to ABC can no longer bind if that mutates to ABM, for example. So they looked at whether this was going to happen, again, using their pseudotype virus system so that they could work with it safely. And what they found is that when they use single antibodies, 
it was very easy for the virus to mutate and no longer be inhibited by those antibodies. So this very process I'm describing occurred. Again, this idea of A, B, C, D, E, F. If an antibody is only binding to A, B, C, they found that it was very easy for the virus to escape the inhibition caused by that antibody. So mutating of any of the ABC parts would allow the virus to go away from the antibody and infect cells very happily. However, what they found was when they combined their antibodies, so using the two together, there was no escape mutants that survived. So no viruses emerged that could escape both antibodies when they bound at different sites. And again, it looks like it's really about the binding at different sites because when two antibodies that cover slightly overlapping sites or cover the same site were used, this allowed vir viral mutants to emerge that escaped the inhibition. So their idea of having these two antibodies that bind at two different sites really seems to be a good way to block the emergence of escape mutants that would no longer be inhibited. And this idea of combining things, combining antibodies or combining drugs is very often used for dealing with viruses because of how quickly they mutate. So for HIV, for example, the highly active antiretroviral therapy that's been a game changer for people with HIV, this is usually a combination of three different drugs that target the virus in different, way, different ways, which means it's, it's much harder for a virus to evolve that can get away from all three. There might be one that gets away from one of the drugs, but then can't get away from the other two, and so it doesn't survive and grow. So this is a com combinatorial therapy is very common and very effective at dealing with viruses. And so this is the approach that Regeneron are taking with combining two monoclonal antibodies that bind to two different sites. And this is now all in clinical trials in humans. So using these antibodies, giving them to people who may develop COVID or who have had a positive confirmation for a COVID case and seeing whether they are protective. Regeneron did something very similar with Ebola and found that they could produce antibodies. I think in that case, it was three antibodies combined, which did help people who were infected with Ebola overcome that infection. So in principle, these, these monoclonal antibody therapies do work or at least have the potential to work, I should stress. So the other thing I want to talk about in the video tonight is the, the work announced today by Eli Lilly, or yesterday by the time I publish this video. So they've got their own monoclonal antibody, which they are calling uh, e, uh, sorry, LYCOV555, so LY-COV555. And again, it's the same principle. They've looked for a monoclonal antibody, and they are putting this into people. So they've announced some interim results from their trial today. So in this trial, they've had 450 people. They've given 150 of those people a placebo, and the other 300 have been given one of three different doses of antibody, ranging from 700 milligrams up to 7,000 milligrams, with an intermediate value of 2,800 milligrams. And what they've announced today is that there are positive results coming from their trial. So they found, or largely somewhat promising results. They've called it promising. Other people not so convinced. I'm not so convinced. The reason for this is that they show, or they say, there's no published paper for this. This is just a press release. They say that the middling dose, the 2,800 milligram dose, caused a reduction in virus compared to control. But the lower dose and the higher dose did not so what you typically would expect to see is that people who get a higher dose would have a greater response and then the middle dose would have a middling response and the low would have nothing. This is called a dose response. So it's a little bit weird that only the middle dose had an effect at reducing the amount of virus in people. And it possibly means it was just a statistical anomaly or that it occurred by chance. However, the good news that came from this is that it does seem to reduce risk of severe disease. So the people in this trial, these 450 people, are all outpatients. So they're all patients who get a positive COVID diagnosis and maybe experiencing symptoms. And they're given the antibody or placebo. And they found that the antibody treated groups had less chance of being hospitalized. So in the study, 6% of their placebo group, so that's nine people, were hospitalized. 
and only 1.7% of their antibody treated group were hospitalized. So of the 300 that received, I think it was 302 specifically, that received antibody treatment, only five of them were hospitalized. So this is a reduction in relative risk of 72%. Now it's early stages, there's no full data out there, it's just a press release, so it's hard to draw firm conclusions on this, but something promising and potentially shows it could be working. However, I do want to stress it's a small sample size, it could all just be statistical anomaly or down to just pure chance that it's come out with these results. We need bigger studies, we need more time looking at this, as I always say, time, 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 more cases, more people, more treatments. Um, but something interesting, and I've wanted to talk about monoclonal antibodies for a little while, so this was a nice one to feed into what I was talking about tonight. So just in conclusion on monoclonal antibodies, it's possible in the lab to identify antibodies that have been produced in humans or in humanized mice, in the case of Regeneron, that combine to viruses such as SARS-2 very effectively and inhibit their ability to infect cells and then use these for a treatment of people that are being affected by said virus. So it uses a similar principle to vaccination insofar as it's using antibodies, but the major difference between the two is that this is a treatment, it isn't necessarily a preventative measure because the antibody doesn't stay around particularly long. It put in as a big bolus of antibody, maybe a few different injections, a few different dosings, but over time that antibody will be turned over in the body, it will be destroyed, it won't last very long. So unlike a vaccine, it can't be something that you give and then that person could be protected for life or for years or a very long time, whatever a vaccine may achieve. This is more of a treatment similarly to a drug. And that's where another slight drawback and limitation of this approach comes in. Producing enough antibody isn't a trivial task. Take, for example, that Eli Lilly study I was talking about where they're seeing an effect with their 2.8 grams of antibody in people. We've had 30 million cases nearly of COVID-19. And if we were going to treat all of them with this antibody, that's going to be nearly 80 million grams of antibody, well, over 80 million, nearly 90 million grams of antibodies that you have to produce that's a lot and that's not necessarily feasible so while this may be promising and while it may be beneficial i think that it's going to be hard to do for this outbreak this pandemic regeneron got good results for their antibodies for ebola but that was much less much less widespread than sars-2 so this may be another good weapon in our arsenal but it's not going to be some sort of ma magic bullet that really changes our fight against this virus. It's potentially something that will help people not be hospitalized or help people who are in severe conditions, but it's not going to be something as preventative as a vaccine, and it may not be as broadly available as, say, a cheaply produced drug might be. But just to stress the fact, the, the more treatment options we have, the better we are going to be able to save people's lives and stop people dying from COVID-19. So I may sound a little negative on monoclonal antibody, antibody therapy as a broadly applicable tool. That doesn't mean it's not worth pursuing. If we've got lots of different companies or lots of different monoclonal antibodies, and we've got multiple different drugs, that's great. And that's a great way for us to deal with this virus and use the same technologies in future to deal with future viral pandemics that we will have to deal with. And that's my view on monoclonal antibodies, I guess. So with all that said, thank you for watching. As usual, if you found the videos, this video useful or interesting, please drop a like for the YouTube metrics and subscribe if you'd like to see more of these videos and be notified for when I put new ones up. Please feel free to leave comments and questions down below and I'll do my best to tackle them. I'm not always timely in responding to comments. My apologies, I'm busy with lab work, but I do try and get around to them. And as always, please stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask and keep calm and carry on. We will get through this pandemic.